Greetings and welcome to another Educator Innovator Hangout on Air. It's Friday, July 25th, and today we'll be talking about Phonar Nation, the biggest photography storytelling class in history, um, with the man who conceived of the idea, uh, and along with an educator who is uh, very much interested in that work. I'm your host, Paul O, and I'm joining the webinar um, actually from my house in Oakland, California. I'm home with a sick child today. Um, typically, I would be in the National Writing Project offices in Berkeley, California. Um, and as I mentioned, our guests today are Jonathan Wirth, award-winning photographer, educator, and founder of Phonar Nation. Uh, joining Jonathan is Mia Zamora, director of the Keene Keen State uh, University Writing the Keen University Writing Project. Excuse me. Um, but let's let our guests uh, start by introducing themselves a little bit more fully. Um, so let's go from my left to right on the screen here. Jonathan, could you take a few moments to introduce yourself? Hi, you've done a really good job of it, Paul. Yeah, my name's uh, Jonathan Worth. I'm a photographer. Uh, recently, I became a teacher, so I'm a principal lecturer at uh, Coventry University in the UK. I teach on a regular undergraduate course, which is that is to say it is a closed course that people, people pay to attend. Um, but I, I, I wrote a couple of the classes so that anyone could attend um, that wasn't attending the university. Wonderful. Thank so you. Me. Great. And uh, we'll talk more about your history and on our nation. Um, but let's move on to Mia for right now. Mia? Sure. Um, my name is Mia Zamora. I am the director of the Kane University Writing Project. And I'm also associate professor of English um, there at Kane University. Um, I'm here because I love storytelling um, and narrative. And it's basically the heart and soul of my work and I'm just thrilled with the work that Jonathan's doing with Phonar Nation and I'm glad to be a part of the conversation today. Wonderful. Thanks Mia. So one more thing before we get started. If you're watching this hangout from the Educator Innovator blog page, we encourage you to jump into the chat to talk with others who are watching. Um, we'll be posting links to resources as they come up uh, throughout the webinar. Um, and if you're watching somewhere else, you'll find uh, the chat at the URL that we'll be posting this moment. Uh, so Jonathan, let's turn to you for a moment. Um, what exactly is Phonar Nation, and how did it come about? Um, well, it, to describe Phonar Nation, I think I have to take a couple of steps back and talk about what Phonar is and why Phonar came about. So, um, so as I said to you before, I was a photographer, and I was a relatively successful photographer. I had a, I had a studio in New York, I had a studio in London, and I would photograph famous people for well-known newspapers and magazines. Um, but there came a point where, where pretty much everyone else became a photographer too. And I mean, this didn't happen overnight. It happened gradually. If the first thing that came along was the was the internet and the mode of distribution of my images. The way people got my images changed from being magazines to being websites. People don't pay for websites, so my entire industry, that that of sort of leg legacy media, uh, went through a paradigm shift. It went through a, a real change. So I came and I I took a job. I was asked to teach a class at um, Coventry University in the UK. Um, now, by this time, there had been this second change. You know, the internet, of course, was well established. Um, I'm not that old, um, but um, people were now getting mobile devices and smart mobile devices as well. Mobile devices that would make images, and so there were suddenly these two big barriers to entry to my practice had been broken down. The first one was um, the first one was was uh, was uh, being able to. Being, being able to make these sorts of images, that, that barrier to entry, the, the, the cost of the equipment, um, the, co the skills needed to, to operate one of those cameras to, to deliver those images of a high enough quality to be able to be published. The second one was then getting access to publish them. And so both of these things got ripped apart with the internet and then with smart devices. So when I came to, to write the class, it seemed entirely inappropriate to write a class that was largely skills based. You know, one that was perhaps more algorithmic, one where you learn to use a camera or learn to light. Or, you know what? People's mobile devices were, were doing that for them. And all that information could be gleaned from YouTube. So it seemed to me a much more important question to be dealing with was what is it that a, a photographer is? What is it that a 21st century photographer is when everyone else is a photographer as well? And so that's what the class at Coventry University set out to try to establish. That class was called Photography and Narrative. Now it had nine people in the room and I did not know how to 
I didn't know how to teach. It was my first ever class, first thing I'd ever done. And so I put the class on a blog and said, what are the, how do we do this? What's the stuff we should be learning? What are the questions we should be asking? And there was a deafening silence for the first week, as you can well imagine. You know, I had to learn a lot about blogging. But within nine weeks, nine people in the room went to 900 people who were all asking the same questions. Now that class ran again the following year and this time it ran with, um, I had some help from my from an ex-student of mine, ex-pupil of mine who'd, who'd gone away, he'd worked as a photographer and he came back, his name was Matt Johnston and he'd learned a lot of stuff that I just didn't know and he came back to work with me and the, the blog got better, the class got better, the class got bigger, 900 people went to 9,000 people that was after 20 weeks and after 30 weeks, after three years um, the class went to up to 35,000 people attending over this 10 week period so there were clearly a lot of people that wanted to know about how, what it was to be a 21st century photographer, what are the, what are the questions that we should be asking and, wh and where should we be seeking these answers now that was awesome but as we looked at all the people that were attending we were sort of painfully aware that we the class size had grown from 9 to 40 paying students in the room but there was this massive number of people who weren't in the room now and a massive amount of those people who weren't in the room would never be in the room they would never be able to afford to go to university or perhaps they might not be able to travel to get to university or you know culturally there may be barriers to them ever going to university and so what we thought about is well how do we write a class that goes that goes outside and goes into that meta class so this is where um, the people at um, DML came in, at UCHRI, and in particular Mimi Ito and Claudia Caro Sullivan, with whom I've worked on Phone Our Nation. And together, with a, with a team of people, we built Phone Our so that it would be accessible by a 12-year-old, a 12 to 17-year-old demographic, in fact. And then working with the, with the, uh, this, the Cities of Learning project this summer, we were able to, to take this class out to the 258,000 at-risk kids that were part of the Cities of Learning project. So then it became a very big, big class. So that is Phonar. So Phonar was photography and narrative, and it became Phonar Nation when it left Coventry University, and it became its own entity, and it went out looking for these 12 to 17-year-olds. So that, in essence, really is, is Phonar Nation. Does that make sense? And that completely makes sense, and uh, what an incredible story. It's an amazing story. Uh, one of the things that I think is really fascinating about the way in which you describe the story is um, that the, this notion of, of uh, essentially opening up with an inquiry into, into what it means to be a photographer mm -hmm. today um, versus uh, you know, s some in your profession or in um, legacy media would decide to figure out you know, how do we lock down our, our, um, our assets you know, how do we create um, means to to uh, to get uh, audiences to pay for these um, these assets? And instead, it seems like you went the direction of, of going more open. Um, and I think that that seems really critical, and it seems like a critical mm -hmm. uh, element and component of Phone Our Nation as well. This notion of what does it mean to be open and openly networked? Um, and I'm wondering if, if you want to talk a little bit more about that, um, Jonathan or Mia. I don't know if you want to jump in at all with, with any questions or thoughts. I actually um, remember Jonathan saying something. I had um, the privilege and honor to be working with Jonathan last week um, because we're working together on um, open ed and um, connected learning within a higher ed context. Um, but we had a conversation, the group of us, and he said something that I'm still thinking about today, and I thought maybe he could share a little bit more about it here because I think um, it's on point which is that at one point in time pre this paradigm shift that he just outlined um, the photograph was used as proof as a piece of evidence um, but at this day and age um, the photograph is more about experience and I think that that paradigm shift leads us to the notion of um, narrative and the opening up of stories in people's lives and what's so powerful about what he's doing in my opinion is that he's giving people a chance to tell the story of their life 
and many stories have not, um, you know, people, you know, his last point um, before he stopped talking just now was about equity and access. And I think um, this idea of experience, that the photograph is at the center of an experience, and at the same time we're looking to broaden our networks and use networks and leverage networks in order to share experiences is at the heart of the work that he's doing, so I thought maybe I would just throw those ideas back at him, the ones he generously um, shared with me last week, so that he could talk a bit more about that. Yeah, I, I, I'd be de delighted to. Yeah, I, um, there's a couple of things that, yes, so um, I think what's really interesting, so as you rightly point out, Mia, yeah, the photograph for the last hundred years um, was used as evidence, you know, seeing was believing. But, um, you know, the image is very different to the photograph, and this is the paradigm shift. We're still describing images with the language we use to describe photographs, and that's because we're old. <laughs> And you know what? Uh, the danger here is that we fetter young people with, underst with understanding what images are, with our understanding of what photographs were. So the prob so photographs were all about seeing is believing. They were used as evidence, but the image, the image is all about experience. Um, it isn't even about photography. This is the amazing thing. I mean, if you look at something, look at how the market responds to something like, uh, let's say, Flickr. Right, so Flickr is a photo sharing site. You can do all sorts of things with your photographs on Flickr. Different sizes, you can mess about with them. It's a site for photographers. Got sold for 22 million. I think it's 22 million. Then look at, um, let's look at Instagram. Instagram, you can't do anything with your pictures. They're tiny little pop images. You, you can't print them out. You can't um, change the sizes of them. You can't even reshare them. That got sold for a billion. So what I would look at there, I would see, I would see Flickr as being about photography, but Instagram as being about communication. Now, if you go one step further and you look at something like Snapchat, you know, an image, a, an image sharing service where you share an image and the image vaporizes after however long you decide, you know, that's clearly not about saving something for evidence. That's very much about experience, and that's what young people are using to to share and to communicate. So I think that that is all really interesting and something for us to explore, especially when we think about storytelling and we think about some of the barriers that are thrown up by something as simple as language. You know, before we think about culture, think about language. So you know, images can move us beyond those spaces. They can help to break down those barriers some, in some ways. But the other point I wanted to pick up on was yours, Paul, which was um, was, uh, it was this idea that by by opening something out, it was being given away for free. And, and I learned this lesson hard with my photography. Um, when I saw my images being shared, I thought, I thought they were going away for free and I was still thinking about them as being my photographs. You know, but I didn't get they were very, very different. Photographs are, as Kevin Kelly describes them, generative. They're, they're artifacts that sit in a room that draw people around them so they can share the experience of being in the room with that photograph at one time. They're fixed in time and space. Whereas images, images, images are unhitched from time and space. They reach out and connect people um, as opposed to bringing them around one room. Now, if we think about that and think about the teacher, well, you know, the classroom experience is one where we all come together and it draws people together. That virtual version of the classroom, making it open, connecting it, connecting it to the network, that reached out and connected people. Now, the class has never been free. The class is the most expensive fees that the university I work for can charge for it. It's also one of the most oversubscribed courses in the university, and it's only five years old. So I, I don't think though you know what I'm saying is I didn't remove the value when I when I opened this class out. What I would say is what I failed to grasp was what my product was as a photographer back when I tried to stop the images being circulated. I didn't get it. I thought my I thought that was my product that people should buy the images, but it wasn't. They were doing something else. As a teacher, my product isn't the information. Most of the information is available on YouTube. So I'm not. I can't compete with that. That puts me. If I'm going to p compete with that, I'm going to go head to head with the internet, and that's never going to work. But when I think about my product as being that shared learning experience, that mentored learning experience in a safe environment where we curate this enormous archive that is the web together, and we learn together, well then, you know, I haven't given that away. In fact, what I've done is I've enriched that. I've enriched it, and I've augmented it by connecting my classroom very publicly. 
to, to this network. And so, you know, I, I just cited what the market says about the values of those different things. One for storing photographs, one for communication. So, you know, my university charges the most it can charge for that class, and it is massively oversubscribed. And and this just recently, the Guardian newspaper in the UK did a survey of all the photography and film courses and it named my photography course as the number one in the UK. And as you look down that list, it's also the youngest course and it's the only course with open classes. I don't think all these things are coincidental. So I think this is, this is something of real value now, having effectively, uh, apparently, given it away for free. Yeah, that, that's wonderful. And, and I have to say that, um, first of all, I, uh, I I uh, love how you frame this this notion of um, you know, what is the product, so to speak, um, that teachers uh, need to be focused on, and this notion of connecting their young people um, to this open network um, and being able to share and communicate through whatever artifacts. In, in this particular case, it's um, images as you describe them. And I'm wondering, uh, from your experience with Phone Our Nation in particular, how how does Phone Our Nation operate so that that becomes possible. Um, you know, what, what are the ways in which young people have this opportunity to connect to a broader network and to share with one another? Uh, what are the ways in which um, they interact with one another and interact with uh, images and, and storytelling? So, so the uh, so Phone Our Nation has been written. Um, it's been written. It's been written for a mobile user explicitly for a mobile user. Uh, it's been written for a teacher, in fact, that's going to teach from a mobile device. Um, and it presumes that the, that the participants don't have expensive cameras. It just relies on them having access to the internet and access to an image-making device. So they can share devices, or they can borrow their teacher's devices, or they can just use the one device that the teacher has in order to do the entire classes. Um, the class is free to access. It's online at phonarnation.org. Um, and, and as soon as you open up, it asks if you want to download it as a web app so that you can you can take it away and, and use it. Um, but the, the key thing here about participating is um, what we what we struck out to do is to not ask people to change their existing patterns of behavior. If I learned anything working for advertising companies, it was that was it. It was it. You know, don't build the success of your product on the assumption that people are going to change what they already do. Build your product around what people already do. And, and I know this sort of language is really going to annoy some people, and it's going to be really bothersome, but hear this out. I've changed my language, and I've deliberately done this. When, I was thinking, when we think about um, building things for Phone R and for Phone R Nation, every change we make, we ask one question. Is this new change going to be a barrier to entry? And if the answer is yes, then it doesn't go in. Now, I thought about that for participants. I thought about language. I thought about geography. I thought about financial um, barriers to entry, and we removed all of them. And, what I, and I became so frustrated that my institution wasn't getting right behind this. And then I realized I'd forgotten about cultural barriers to entry. So there are cultural barriers to entry for uh, globally that we have to deal with. But there are also ones within our institutions. There was a management culture um, and there was, there was a clear barrier to entry. When I said open, the management in my institution heard free. That was a real problem for them. However, when I use the word connected, they heard network and they heard value. So now I talk about net. I talk about connected classes. I don't talk about open classes. When I talk about the product, and I talk about, I might. When I talk about that that moment when I realized that it was the learning experience rather than the information that was the value was a value. I talk about value assets to the management. I say, so I think about what the value asset was in this classroom, and it was the learning experience. It wasn't the information. It wasn't the textbook. There's no future in textbooks. And so we have to, so I say that, and then I say, well, you know what? So what I did was I made that, that value asset into an outward-facing asset by opening the class out. And then it became a touch point. It became a touch point for 35,000 people over 10 weeks. That's 35,000 people well, that's, that's twice as many people as go to this university. For them, their first experience of invert, in, insert whatever you want, university, was this classroom. And it's not only this classroom, it was the most exciting thing about this classroom. It was all the fun stuff we were doing in the room together. And then it becomes like a no-brainer. I mean, who is not going to want to put the best stuff in the shop in the shop window? So that enables me to run my class openly because it starts to make sense to the management. Um, and I'm, I apologize for all those people that are going to be hearing it and think, you know, thinking they don't want to use that language, and I, I appreciate that. But it's been, it's, it, for me, it was a, it, it's been worthwhile. 
and it, I, I'd, I'd, ver I'd urge people to sort of consider it. And I know I've gone off topic now. What was the question again, Paul? Sorry. Uh, no, that's fine, actually. I, I really appreciate that. And I think it, it actually brings up for me uh, the ways in which um, Mia, for instance, as someone who uh, would be talking to her community about Phonar and Phonar Nation, um, you know, how she might uh, uh, essentially, uh, I guess, market or sell or, or uh, try to persuade um, you know, her community to, to take this up and what she sees as the value of this for both uh, the educators she works with because she has such an extensive net network of educators and the young people she works with. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting to think about framing discourse so that we can maximize the gateway or the entry point for empowerment. I think that's what we're talking about, right? <laughs> and I love that um, sort of assertion of a, of a different way of thinking of open, um, you know, if it threatens um, industry model, market models. Um, I love that kind of repositioning as connected because that's, I think, what education in the future of education is all about is the idea of connected learning, um, building networks and empowering students to find their voice so that they can tell their stories on the terms that are most familiar to them and in the process learn how to think critically, develop argumentation, um, and navigate the world in a graceful way. You know, um, in terms of Phonar Nation and the specific work there and how I imagine it can segue with other networks, I think we're um, sort of on the precipice of two powerful um, I mean, I'm looking at two powerful networks. The National Writing Project, which is essentially, um, you know, a large organization that um, supports writing pedagogy in schools throughout, um, well, globally, but, um, you know, most richly in the United States. There's over 200 writing project sites in the United States, and each and every one of those writing projects supports teachers in the teaching of writing. Um, what I think is that if we could reach out to teachers and then ultimately to their students about um, storytelling and thinking about writing in a more broad sense than just the traditional entry points that, um, you know, I often say that the five um, paragraph essay, the formulaic five paragraph essay is where writing, the soul of writing goes to die. <laughs> and I think, um, you know, an, a connected open network like Phonar can reinvigorate the power of writing um, and even do that through new technologies and um, in the process the development of networks and community building around the stories that young people want to tell. So I imagine that um, we can work in the future together to further connect these two networks and in the process they'll probably um, be even other people sort of finding their way into those communities and, and you know sharing sharing the opportunities with other networks. Um, I, I think teachers struggle to teach writing effectively um, and the, at the same time you know they're hemmed in by so many constraints in terms of the assessments and regulations that they face within their classroom environment. Um, so um, that's a real challenge for educators these days and yet at the same time if we can think about opening up writing process to creative um, access points that students can get really excited about I think we're moving in the right direction and just like photography experiencing a paradigm shift I think also narrative writing itself um, is, experience, is experiencing a similar kind of paradigm shift there's many ways to tell a story these days and we need to think about writing as a broader making process than just um, formulaic um, textual engagement. Yeah, John, can I, did you can want to I, jump in? I did actually. Yeah, only to only to say, I, you know, I, I suddenly realised I hadn't actually front ended this conversation with um, with with the just owning up and saying that I only ever wanted to be a writer. I only wanted to be a writer, and you know, I've read, and my you know, my earliest memories of my mother reading to me, and then as then me learning to read, and I have never stopped reading, and I always wanted to be a writer, but I wasn't very good at it, right? And so there came a point where I had to say, I had to realize that I wasn't very good at it, and get over it. <laughs> 
but I was okay at making images. And so I still wanted to be, I wanted to be, I wanted to work as a journalist. I wanted to be one of these sort of, you know, these photojournalists that runs off and changes the world, but um, I wasn't. I didn't really, uh, I didn't have quite the guts for that, I have to be honest and say. What I did used to do was I used to find really great writers and I would throw ideas at them constantly and then I would work with them. And the best work I ever did would always be working with a writer because you both see the world in a, in a, in a completely different way. So you can go into the same environment and you see it in a different way and you come back with this, with this we're in a good relationship, you come back with this very sort of sympathetic, empathetic um, sort of meta-narrative and, and, and it's, a, it's a wonderful experience. So as, as for engaging with Phone Our Nation, I mean, I am so excited about this opportunity to work with the National Writing Project and with any, any uh, storyteller. Um, what we have right now is we have loads of people that are interested in making images, loads of image makers. And we're teaching them about storytelling. What I see you and your networks is offering are the chance to connect with storytellers who might want to learn about um, visual storytelling, who want, might want to learn about image making. I mean, I've only ever thought about phonar and photography and narrative as being about learning to learning to, to, to read and write with images, learning to speak with images, learning to speak clearly, learning to be trusted. And, I, and we, st we spoke earlier on about um, the fact that the, the, the the photograph used to be about evidence, and it, it, its its currency used to be seeing was believing. Well, with the image, you know, everybody's making images, so it's no longer about seeing is believing. The the issue here is that you have to be believed in order to be heard. So you have to be credible. You have to be trusted. And when you get someone's attention, you have to speak clearly with images. You know, this is bread and butter to you, to to a writer. But to an image maker, this is this is new news. And to someone who happens to have a smartphone who wants to start making images, this is a whole new world. So I think this is a really rich ground for us to explore together. And I'm so excited about the about the about the potential and the opportunities that there are for us to work together. Yeah, I, I'm so glad that you brought up this uh, this whole notion of, of um, visual literacy uh, because that is clearly a critical skill uh, that you know young people need to be able to have in order to be successful. Um, in order to be able to navigate uh, even um, civic dialogue, um, conversations, the ability to uh, interact in, you know, in, in our democratic societies. Um, uh, I think even just to simply be in communication with one another, they need these critical visual literacy skills. Um, so that seems uh, totally vital uh, and uh, an amazing um, attribute of our nation. Another piece of this that I, that I was hoping um, you two could talk a little bit more about uh, because it really strikes me too having spent time in schools is uh, the notion of being able to leverage the, the powerful um, computing device that is also an image maker that resides in the pockets of, of most kids who I've um, come in contact with. You know, I realize that that's not true for all kids, um, but for many kids, uh, you know, I've been doing some work in the Oakland um, Public Schools, which is uh, definitely an under-resourced district here in California. Um, and yet, most kids come to school with um, with mobile devices. And yet, you know, in many of the schools we see posted signs that say, uh, you know, "Cell phones need to be put away." It seems like, um, as well, this is an incredible opportunity to give um, educators this uh, this reason to leverage uh, these amazing devices. And I'm wondering if um, if you could say more about this uh, mobility question, too. I'll, 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 me, stop me, because I'm gonna. This is, this is a real bugbear for me. So I, so I, I, um, I've acted as external examiners in sort of various universities in the UK. You know, I'm, I'm sure you have a similar process over here in the US, where someone from one university will go to another university, you'll look at their course, and you'll assess it in terms of parity of grading and so on and so forth, and you'll suggest things at the end that you think are important or could be improved, or things that are of merit that you would note. And you go back to your own university. Well, I went to one recently, and um, and this 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 particular university was teaching digital photography. And I said, so you you teach digital practice, you know, how to use a digital camera. And um, so what about sort of digital fluency, right? So you know, visual literacy, I, you understand semiotics, how to read images and so on, how to speak with them. That's great. But how do you get heard? Do you teach digital fluency? And of course, this was just drawn with, drawn a blank. And the reason I asked this question is because I asked the students when we were when we were talking to them, I said, you know, what are, what are good and bad about the course? And uh, I said, do, do you guys, what, what, what on, online environments do you guys meet up in to talk about the course? Because, you know, the reality is that a lot of them have to work full time just to go to college. 
and they don't get to go to the classes when they'd want to. It's another reason why recording the classes, doing them asynchronously, can really help those students that are really struggling to keep along academically or, or financially. Anyway, I asked them, what are, the, what, are the, what are the lifeboats that you've built? And they said, oh, we have a Facebook page. I said, all right, you know, most of the courses have a Facebook page that I've, I'm aware of. Um, I said, but the thing is, we can't access it to, uh, with the university because Facebook is banned. And so I said, you what? You know, that's, that's crazy. I said, oh, it's okay, it's fine. We just go onto our mobile devices and we, we access it that way. So I brought this up with the, the institution. I said, you know, so tell me, you know, why is Facebook banned with your adults that you're teaching on, on this site? And they said, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's just not an appropriate, in, in, uh, not an appropriate environment to, for the students to be in. It's a distraction. I thought, and I had to bring this up, you know, this is, this is crazy. You know, all you succeeded in doing here is forcing your students away from your, your what is it, learning management system, your, uh, your on-site your on network, and you force them out into the wild to go and make their own way. I mean, surely they should be learning about these environments with you. If this is an our job, to, to learn about these environments and how to navigate them and how to exploit them and how to, 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 to engage with them, then what is our jobs? Anyway, the long and the short of it was that, it, you know, once... Once the, the, this had been brought up, the, the university changed, and it, it, its university-wide policy changed to, to start to operate in these environments, which is great. But, but I think it comes from the mindset that presumes that your class is not already connected, which is crazy. The class is connected. The students have smart devices. They are connected. And if you haven't got a site set up already for them to meet in, a common room, a virtual common room, then they're in Facebook. And if you ban it, they're going to go there after, after school, and they're going to go on the networks that are outside the university. So, you know, you have the choice of fighting against it, like I used to do with my practice, or you can leverage the enormous potential of connecting your classroom. And I think that is super exciting. Um, I, um, I mean, what do you think, Mia? What, I'm yeah, I, I quite agree with everything you're saying. Um, and I just wanted to also to point out um, one thing that I was thinking when Paul was prompting us that, um, you know, so the students have their smartphones and their social media sites. Um, and there's a back channel whether or not to, to conversations and community, whether or not we're embracing them in any effective way. So why not um, extend the classroom beyond the four walls, right? Um, that's what we're talking about, connected learning in the best sense. Um, I also wanted to um, just uh, point to the the paradigm shift of, of making and production-centered and project-driven learning as well, which Phone Our Nation, I think, um, exemplifies so powerfully because um, the bottom line is in, in the, the pre-paradigm shift days, as you so aptly pointed out, the professor or the teacher was the sage on the stage and students were just sieves to be filled, their minds were to be filled with the content. Um, and that's just not the way it is any longer. Um, we are guiding them to to think in complex and engaged ways. Um, and the best way to teach them how to do that is to um, give them the chance to um, explore what's, uh, what drives them, their self-interested, um, you know, their self-informed um, projects. So, um, and then that brings in the technology and has to bring in the technology of this day and age. Um, so yeah, I just I, I think that um, Phone Our Nation exemplifies in many ways the connected learning paradigms of production-centered learning of making, but and the net and the networked um, world that we live in and um, embracing that and and um, leveraging that in ways that empower students. Um, and then also another element um, that we haven't brought up but is very much a part of this environment we're talking about is peer learning, um, the way that students teach each other in these environments. Um, you know, so I think all of, and, um, you know, uh, also co-learning, where the, the professor or the teacher then becomes a learner side by side with the student. I think these are um, exciting times, dynamic times for, for the context of education and also for the, um, you know, the movement forward of aesthetic forms like photography. Um, you know, in some sense, there, there's transition happening that's insistent and if we don't respond to it, we'll be fools because it's going to happen 
happen anyway. Um, so institutions need to pay attention, but educators need to take heart and, and um, harness the power of, of this moment in ways that make learning matter for their students. Thanks, Amelia. Well said. And I, I just want to jump in. Uh, Jonathan, uh, you should respond to me if you'd like. Uh, but I just want to mention that there is a, a question that came up in the chat, and, and this is, uh, uh, it's, I think, the part of uh, perhaps logistical questions that we might be able to answer. So this, this question is, um, can out-of-school program educators join Phone Our Nation? And so perhaps, you know, we could say, who is welcome in Phone Our Nation? Yeah, absolutely. I should have said it at the beginning. You know, um, when I referred to the meta class and writing a class for the people that weren't in the classroom, it was explicitly for people who, yes, who weren't, who aren't in school. So no, I mean the class is being run by librarians, um, largely in this, by the Cities of Learning project and community leaders. Um, we've got a great iteration happening in Ireland, which is happening at an asylum centre, which has been set up by a photographer who who wanted to share his passion for photography and introduce it to the people at that asylum center. And, you know, although it's been written for 12 to 17 year olds, what he found was that running the class three, well, two weeks in, the, the parents had moved from, from a closed door next room to opening the door, to sitting in the doorway to listen to the class. So in week three, he officially invited them into the classroom. And so from week three to, to five, that he taught the, the children and the parents. And if you get chance to have a look at Damien Drohan's Phone Our Nation Ireland and just to see some of the people there and their responses to the program, clearly English not being their f first language, but every one of them evidently has a story to tell. You know, it's really moving and I think that's a great example of someone who's not a school teacher, who's not, who isn't a part of a, a sort of a traditional learning environment, taking the class and making it his own, you know, he's a he's in particularly a, a portrait photographer, and he wants it to talk about portrait. But it could be easily be someone who's interested in any other form of photography or just storytelling in general. I mean, the like the classes are licensed explicitly for either adoption or adaption. You know, they're, they're CC licensed so that you can take them, make them better, make them more appropriate for your audience, reference them where they were built with attribution so that you can still, um, still access the network. I mean, that attribution is largely just using the hashtag phonar. I mean, uh, so, you know, take them, adapt them, make them better for your, for your um, community, and then leverage the network, leverage it via phonar so that you can, you can get your class heard. And if people have questions about how they should do this, if it seems daunting or opaque, then just reach out to me because I have time to spend um, taking people by the hand and, and walking them through it. I can do webinars or we can, we can work via email. I mean, my phonarnation.org um, has all the information about how to reach out to us. Um, but if I'll leave my details at the end of this webinar so people can email me directly. That sounds great, Jonathan. And, and just in terms of uh, if we could just continue on this thread for a moment um, with regard to logistics. Uh, so uh, is it the case that there is going to be um, soon, I believe this is true, uh, an iteration of uh, or a new round of Phone Our Nation, and that's uh, starting up in just a couple of weeks? I was wondering if um, you could uh, just elaborate on that a little bit. Yes, so um, the class was written, originally Phonar, Photography and Narrative, was a 10-week class. So we tried to compress it down more and more, and eventually we just rewrote it. We took the important stuff out and we rewrote it for five weeks. And so that means that this summer we had time for two iterations, two five-week iterations. Um, but yes, and you're right, so we are currently, you know, uh, the next iteration starts next Monday, so I think that's the 28th of July, so that's after this weekend, that's when it'll be starting, but you know, really this is kind of meaningless. We're unhitched from time and space. You know, the Phonar, the hashtag, lives year round. Somebody picking this webinar up or finding, coming across Phonar Nation, um, in October 2016, you know, run it, run it, make it better, make it relevant for, with the issues that are happening right now. We'll, hopefully we'll still be around, you can find out what happened afterwards, um, but hopefully the network will be even bigger and even better and you'll be able to really get your students heard. But no, um, take it, mess around and play with it. The class is also, wor it's also worth noting, the class has been written explicitly so that you could drop in and drop out whenever you feel like it. There is no pressure to come in on week one and only feel as though you've achieved something if you leave in week five. 
you can come in for one session. It's like I always, I was thinking like it was going to be like a Brechtian play. You know, you can walk in and walk out at any moment. You should take something from it. <laughs> you are the only, you are the first people who've actually got that. So that's, that's whenever I mention that to photographers, they always sort of look at me puzzled. But anyway, yeah. So you can walk in and walk out at any point um, of, of of the of the course, and um, you know, and and take something from it. Hopefully, so yes. Make new rules. Wonderful. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, I, I wanted to turn back to something that Mia was talking about, which is uh, trends, as she talked about. Um, and I wonder if it, one way to describe this trend, and I've heard people talk about this with regard to making in general, is uh, this notion that um, the creative impulses of young people are essentially uh, being under-recognized and underutilized in, in schools, and uh, particularly in schools today, and that in our nation, this notion of, of uh, creating images and being able to share those images to um, to, to use images to tell stories, um, to create narratives, that that, that is uh, part of this movement of, of uh, really resurrecting this notion of um, using creativity as an element in our educational process. And I'm wondering if um, either of you have thoughts on that. Well, I was as you were saying that, Paul, I was thinking about um, the Connected Learning massive open online course that um, is being run by Educator Innovator and, and National Writing Project. Um, and I had um, recently completed the facilitation of a week called Hack Your Writing, in which we sort of challenged everyone or prompted everyone to um, revoice a text, um, to remix with the notion of um, creative innovation. Um, and the undercurrent of that word hack, too, of um, the idea of collective action in some way. Um, but what I found interesting after sort of working through all of those ideas and watching the community rise to the challenge in wonderfully dynamic and creative ways through the course of a week, I, I started to think about the fact that we need a broader gateway for a notion of what writing is and what building narrative is and that something like hacking your writing using digital tools often um, to rework storytelling um, sort of opens up the power of writing for students who might not feel drawn to the process otherwise and I think that um, visual literacy plays a major role in in that kind of refiguring of um, you know how to get students in to writing um, so yeah that's why I'm quite excited about um, Phonar and I have to admit I you know based on what Jonathan was saying about it's an open call and you can come when you or go as you please I, I should mention that I'm I'm signed up for the next cycle myself, and I'm planning on being a lurker because I, I I don't know how much with all the other things on my plate right now. I don't know how much I can consistently um, complete every every um, cycle, but I most definitely will be learning quite a bit, and that's what's fascinating about these kinds of networked learning experiences. That sometimes people, uh, you know, aren't you know particularly loud voices within a network but still are generating a tremendous amount of new learning experience for themselves and are being transformed um, you know, on their own terms. So um, at any rate, um, my comments are about um, sort of broadening or the gateway to narrative um, and also just an admittance that um, I dabble and tinker all the time <laughs> and I'm going to lurk in Phonar as a way to improve my own um, you know visual literacies so that I can you know um, sort of be an effective respondent to my students writing as well. So, so I, I, I would also say that it's broadened the gateway to writing so um, in response to that, um, I must say that when I sort of said that there were no more rules now, when, when you were trying to, when we were trying to understand what it was to be a 21st century photographer, you know, that was a real, really liberating moment for me, because in that moment we also said, well, I also realised that I had made a career making pictures for 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 paper, right, for paper, for magazines, for newspapers, but my students were going to make images for screens, and screens come with speakers. And speak and screens also want to play moving images too. So that meant they had to learn about all these things. So that meant we had to learn about sound, didn't we? And we had to learn about it together. That was completely new territory for me. And we had to learn about moving images as well. 
And then we had to go and learn about where does photography sit within all these things. That was fabulous. And the other thing as well was when when we when we sort of took the, the lid off this box and 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 sort of accepted that that the students could go anywhere they wanted whilst we were in the class. We also what we did there, Matt and I, was what we said is, you know, you, you have to be so interested, this class has to be so interested that your interest driven learning has to drive you to want to stay in this class, to stay in this room, to stay in these environments, to, to engage with what we're doing. And the only way that Matt and I could make that work was to focus on interest led teaching interest driven teaching we had to take we had to talk about the stuff that we were passionate about and we were really interested in and that took us away from photography at times you know it took i i wanted to interview i wanted to work out how the science fiction writer Cory Doctorow how his business model worked i wanted to i wanted to i wanted to talk to him about his writing as well and how could we work together as photographers and how could photographers do some of this stuff you know and and the class exploded and we got such great work back. We got back we got back written pieces, we got back spoken pieces, we got back movies. I had students that have gone on to become archivists. I didn't know how I don't know how you become an archivist. I didn't realise that after three years of studying photography, it turns people into really well, better editors than people who haven't spent looked at tens of thousands of images over three years and thought about what those pictures mean rather than just what they look like. You know, they, it turns out those people are highly visually literate. They make great archivists, of course they do. They make great editors as well, photo editors. We've had students that have gone on to become filmmakers. We had one that was employed directly from the course because a filmmaker was watching their work evolve through the class. Halfway through the class they decided they'd learnt enough and they needed to come and work for them. They went off to work for Doctors Without Borders and the BBC with this particular filmmaker. So. I didn't teach any of those skills. I have to put my hand up at that point and say that I didn't teach any of that stuff, but we all learned it together. And the vast majority of the learning was what they did because they absolutely loved it. The class the class had to run between 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. once a week. It was only worth 20 credits. That's not a lot for a UK degree course. And I was warned when, the, when I continued to teach after 1 o'clock but the students didn't leave the room and so the only way that I could get around this was to set up um, technical instruction that would continue after one o'clock so I think that, that my, my takeaway my point is that if you find something that you are really passionate about and really interested in and you can possibly find a way of drawing it into your teaching then the stu that enthusiasm is so infectious and it's so powerful that um, you know, that it's, it, the whole experience becomes so much richer for both the teacher and for the student. Um, you know, I look forward to my classes starting. I can't wait, and I get really excited about what we're going to learn about. And the honest truth is that I don't know what we're going to learn about this year. My my degree class starts in October, and I won't know what the issues are we're going to explore until the end of September, which is terrifying. But it's also it means that we're going to have a really exciting journey. <laughs> That's an amazing testimonial for interest-driven learning. Uh, I, I don't know that I've heard it um, articulated better, Jonathan. Uh, I feel like we need to capture that snippet and and um, and, and put it up in, in as many places as we can, um, because I think that there's so many misconceptions about what interest-driven means uh, and so many misconceptions about what it can lead to. Uh, I think that there's the fears that many educators have about, um, well, if kids are only uh, Pursuing what they're interested in, you know, does that lead to chaos? Does that lead to a lack of um, lack of skills? And actually, I think what you are able to articulate and what you've experienced is is completely the opposite, completely the reverse. And so, yes, thank you, thank you for saying that. And like I said, we're going to need to showcase that in as many places as possible. Your words. Um, we're getting close to the top of the hour. I had uh, one other thought that I just wanted to throw out there to you both. Uh, I, I'm really struck by, by this notion, Jonathan, that you started with this inquiry, this question of, well, what does it mean to be a 21st century photographer? And in many respects, I think we at the National Writing Project have, start, have had this question for a number of years now of, um, what does it mean to be a 21st century writer? Um, what does it mean, uh, I suppose, in, in particular in relation to Fun on Nation, what does it mean to be a 21st century um, storyteller. What does it mean to tell storytelling uh, today? And I think you've given us all incredible food for thought um, with regard to you know, where we might uh, begin to conceptualize uh, the answers to that question, or how we might uh, begin to track uh, our thoughts in relation to that question of what it means. <coughs> excuse me.
be a 21st century writer. Um, and so uh, I guess uh, just throwing out there to the both of you, if you had any um, final thoughts uh, either about um, Phonar or Phonar Nation or, or uh, anything in particular from this conversation today that you'd like to share. Um, I think because, as I said, we're getting close to the end. I just wanted to um, share one current that I think um, on some level is, is somewhat obvious, but I'd like to stay, say it anyway. I think we want our students, we want learners everywhere to be able to produce their own stories rather than just consume stories. And I think that at the heart of that distinction is a dynamic um, society, a society bound to democratic principles um, and uh, civic engagement that um, honors difference and is committed to justice on some level. So I see this, I see this kind of paradigm shift for educators, for artists, etc., as a crucial one in moving forward in a way that. Um, it, you know, in a way in which the world could thrive and, um, you know, the younger generations coming forward will thrive within. Um, again, that notion that um, they need to move beyond just consuming the digital media that surrounds them, that they are steeped in, and be able to produce um, text, um, images, stories on their own terms so that there can be conversations had. Yeah, I um, I I want to echo. I want to echo that. I want to echo that because you know, when you, to, to somebody forced me to sum up what Phonar Nation was about. Phonar was about in one sentence, and it was, it was to empower people to re participate in their own representation. I can't think of anything more important. Be it youth, be it the majority world, be it be it whoever. But I have a challenge for you, and this would really help me if you can break this down or take this forward. So when I was thinking about what it was to be a 21st century photographer and wrote the courses, I could find three things that were most important and I, we, I f focused everything on three tracks. One is you have to be able to produce something that can't be digitized. So for a photographer, that you have to have these arcane skills. I can produce a print, a, a, a double layer of paper and silver print that will last for 200 years. Um, you know, your iPhone can't do that. I can do that, I can print it, I can put it on the wall and it will be of value, it will be fixed in time and it will age. There is a craft to that that you can't get an app for, right? <laughs> so the second thing is, um, if you, it's all very well being able to make something that no one else can make, but um, you know, is it, is it credible? So you have to be trusted and you have to be credible. That's the second thing. You have to be a trusted source, credible witness. The third thing is it's all very well being able to make things no one else can make and be trusted and believed when you make them, but who's listening? If you can't get heard by the right people, then you're just talking to yourself. So there are the three things that I think are most important for the 21st century photographer. You've got to be able to make something that can't be digitized. You've got to be trusted and believed, and you've got to be heard. So um, artisan, storyteller, publisher. I wonder if those three things run true for the writer as well, and I would love to hear if they're appropriate or not. I think that you know that that encapsulates so much of um, you know the writers the a writer moving forward in this day and age as well. Paul, you wanted to say something. I didn't want to cut you off. Oh no, please go ahead, Mia. I was I was just going to respond as well. So go ahead. Um, no, I that was it. I didn't have much more to say. So Paul, you you take that up. Yeah, I, I was just going to say uh, in closing, actually, and I'm glad you brought that up, Jonathan, because. Yeah, I was really struck by this notion of digital fluency, this term that uh, I don't know that I've uh, really heard used in this context before uh, or in a context in which, uh, well, I, I'm not even sure what the context would be. Um, so it really struck me. And I think what you laid out in many respects um, in this uh, last um, statement of yours um, is you know, essentially elements of digital fluency, which I think can uh, reach across um, uh, media. Uh, so, so I think what what you're describing perhaps could be applicable to the writer, to the, the video producer, um, and you know, and I, I think it is definitely food for thought. It's something that you know, uh, me and the rest of our network will definitely take time to consider and and um, and come back to you with a response. Uh, I just think that the the, the notion of of literacy, um, as as you've uh, talked about it. 
really does fall short because this notion of fluency, this ability to um, to speak to an audience with an audience in mind, but then to actually get that audience, I feel like is so much a part of the um, social media world in which we live and in which our kids live, most importantly. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I think I think those are um, that, that's a great framework actually, and, and one that I'm sure me and I will be having lots of conversations about, and, it, and I hope that we can pull you into those conversations in the future. Yeah, and particularly, um, you know, uh, I'm thinking a lot about this idea of you have to be trusted. How does one um, become a kind of reliable um, voice of knowing in any context? I think that's a fascinating question for the 21st century, 21st century writer, learner, artist. Um, and also this whole business about being a self-publisher on some level, um, that, in, that to me is quite intriguing. Your first point, Jonathan, I think um, is uh, sort of um, well established on some level, the kind of the, um, the craft issue. Um, but the, the last two, I think, are, are sort of things that are emerging in this moment and are still being negotiated and um, I'm very um, pleased that you sort of brought them to the foreground because there are things that I think we do need to think about collectively. Um, I know there have been extended conversations about trust, um, and I know also that you've made some points in another con, uh, you know, earlier when we were talking earlier, not within this webinar, about co um, sort of collateral um, trust being associated with a within a context can, can lend you a, a kind of voice and trust. Um, I think these are all fascinating questions um, and um, one thing, just one final um, thought before we close out is that I think in many ways the paradigm shifts that we've uh, um, articulated here today are about the renegotiation of authority in the 21st century. You know, who is the authority and who endorses particular things and, and um, to what extent do certain things get, le um, get leverage because of an uh, endorsement or a kind of authoritative stamp. Um, so those two questions of both trust and um, you need to publish your work, um, remain, um, you know, somewhat dynamic things to think about because the terms of authority and authoritative stamp have shifted so dramatically in regards to those ideas. Can I, yeah, just to, to preempt the person who's going to come in and say, I don't want to self-publish, hearing publishing being about just sticking stuff on a blog, that's not what it is. So when I talk about publishing, I'm talking about engaging people, engaging networks, engaging audiences. And this idea of digital fluency, what I'm trying to get at there is, you know, we talk about literacy, we, we talk about people learning to read, but we forget, you know, that it actually meant people learning to write, not just people learning to read. And when we talk about digital literacy, you know, everybody can make images, but, but can they get them seen? And so th that was my point there, you know, of, of all those images, speaking with images is all very well, but if you're just speaking out into the chaos, then you're not getting heard. And that's not how you get civic engagement. People just speaking and not being heard, that does not make people who want to engage and who want to participate in their own representation. I think this is a much bigger conversation that I'm really happy and looking forward to to working through with you guys. <laughs> yeah, and I'll, I'll just um, add as a final thought, I think uh, that those are great points, Jonathan, and uh, mm -hmm. one way that we have been looking at that, yeah, I think I mentioned earlier that I'm involved in a project in, in the Oakland Unified Schools, and, and that project is focused on civic engagement and what does it mean to be um, civically engaged uh, today. Uh, it's called Educating for Democracy in the Digital Age. And, um, you know, one of the things that we, I mean, there, there are a couple of catchphrases that I'll just throw out and we can talk about at some future point, but one is um, we have this question of well, what does it mean to be community ready? You know, so there's a lot of talk in the United States at least about being college and career ready. What does it mean to be community ready? And alongside the, this notion of community ready um, it, it is this question of um, how do you move from voice to impact? So I think it's this idea that you brought up, this notion of um, not simply uh, say posting, a, you know, having your own blog, but how do you engage in conversation with others? How do you um, how do you have that uh, dialogue, um, and uh, how are you able to then um, you know, engage in civic uh, and civil discourse um, beyond just simply having your own voice? Um, so all uh, amazing questions, and it's wonderful to think of um, Phonar and Phonar Nation as 
is tackling these questions as well as they surely do. Um, so with that, we've actually come to the top of the hour, and I just wanted to thank uh, Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, really, uh, just we so much appreciate you being willing to take time from your busy schedule. You're you're tuning in from New York City uh, while you're on the road. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time. And Nia, you too. I know that um, we pulled you into this conversation uh, pretty much last mm -hmm. second, and uh, you were willing to, to join. So thanks to both of you. My thank pleasure. You. <laughs> Absolutely. Me too. Thank you. Great. And so I'll just close by saying, um, for those of you in the audience, if you're interested in learning more about Connected Learning, uh, please make sure to check out the Connected Learning Alliance site at clalliance.org, where there are tremendous testimonials from practitioners and informative multimedia pieces about Connected Learning. Uh, if you'd like to keep abreast of future opportunities here at Educator Innovator um, from partners, mm -hmm. and from a, a range of partners, uh, sign up for the monthly newsletter at educatorinnovator.org and follow Educator Innovator on Twitter at innovates underscore ed. Uh, thanks, everyone.